are you going to the Pioneer Greenhouse Conference in Pittsburgh uh, next month? The Center for Innovation, they call it now. It's going to be a lot of nursing homes there. So, can you not hear me? You're muted. You should be able to unmute. Ah, uh, now I can. Thank you. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Okay. I was thinking that it was going to be a very quiet and quick presentation. <laughs> right, right. I am not going to that conference, but I wish I was. I've never been to a green, greenhouse conference before, but um, Susan Ryan and Penny Cook have been very involved with, you know, our work and, um, and so have other people from Live Oak and other organizations that will be there. So um, seems like there's a lot of interest, so I think that'll be that'll be good. They are just spectacular partners, so that's yeah. really a gift to partner with them. Yeah, well, I see a list of names. Oh, they're not. We can't see them because they're not spotlighted. Hmm. All right, Alice, if you can hear me, it looks like yeah. you've got a a good group of folks um, on the right. call. I think. About 45 Sumeri. of us. Yeah. Okay. Sumere, is there a way for me to see everybody and not just the spotlighted people or no? It doesn't matter. I'm just asking. Does that help? No, you just, now I just disappeared from the screen. <laughs> I wonder um, if you could find the participant window. Um, it should be either on the bottom panel or the top panel. Okay. If you want to take down my slides, well, no, no, that's fine. That's fine. Okay. It's not. I can. I can manage. Um, who can see your messages more? Um, it usually pops up with the chat, but it didn't. More. Um, I can remove my spotlight and see what happens. No, no, that's fine. I, I'll just. Um, I'll just scroll through. I can see the chat. I don't know if anybody's chatted in anything yet, Sumiri. Not yet, um, but I do see we're at the top of the hour. Uh, okay. If you want to kick us off, Alice. Okay. Well, um, but I don't know if you want to spotlight me again, that's fine. And if not, it's fine too. Oh, there we are. Okay. Um, hi, everybody. Welcome. Uh, we're so glad you've joined today. This is Alice Bonner, uh, chair of the Moving Forward Nursing Home Quality Coalition. And this is one of our coalition conversations. We have one or two of them every month now. And um, we try to highlight things that are uh, important that you have all told us are important to you. So this is part of what matters to you. And today we're uh, delighted to have a wonderful guest speaker, Dr. Leslie Eber, who's going to talk to us about trust and, and other related topics. But first, uh, on behalf of the Moving Forward Coalition, I want to just say that I'm joined today by Sumire Maki, who is our program manager, and Isaac Longo. Barty, uh, who's our director, uh, and uh, many of you on this call are, you know, members of some of our committees or work groups, or you're otherwise involved with our work. So we want to say a huge thank you to all of you. Related to that, the only other point I want to make uh, before I turn it over to Leslie is we're very, very excited. We have been reviewing nine action plans for the last several weeks, Isaac, Sumire, myself, and uh, all of our steering committee and co-chairs. And it's an incredible amount of work that the committees have done over the last year. Uh, the action plans are dynamic. They're, um, they're, they're more than just a set of recommendations. They're step-by-step -step ways that we can improve practice now and continue to work together on policy changes that are gonna be meaningful to quality of life for people who live in nursing homes. So um, it's an important uh, element of our work right now that we're moving into year two and the action plans are giving us this framework for how we're gonna move forward. So um, they're gonna be posted in mid-July. And what we would really encourage all of you to do is please check back on the website in mid-July 
and let your colleagues know that the action plans are going to be posted then because we really want people to look at them, give us feedback, tell us what you think. You know, what did we miss? What, what else can we do beyond what's in those plans and how can people get more involved? So go to the website. If you're not already signed up to be a participant, please feel free to do that. And if you, um, if you would take a look at the action plans and, and see what you think. Other ways people can communicate, some people like to use LinkedIn and we can uh, chat in some directions about, about using LinkedIn or you can contact us and we can help with that. So any and all communication is good uh, and we're really excited to be moving forward. And if you have any uh, questions in the chat, uh, yeah, uh, please put into the chat uh, any questions related to the action plans or anything else. So um, with that, I would like to introduce uh, Leslie Eber, who's a wonderful colleague and has been a, a participant with us uh, with the Moving Forward Coalition. Uh, she got her uh, MD degree from the University of Vermont College of Medicine, and she did her internal medicine uh, residency at St. St. Joseph's uh, Hospital in Denver, Colorado. Uh, she's uh, boarded in internal medicine and she's a medical director. She divides her time between a whole bunch of places and in particular practices at Rocky Mountain Senior Care. Um, she is uh, very involved with national policy. We were talking before about immunization rates during COVID-19 uh, and other aspects of immunizations. She uh, chairs the Colorado Dementia Partnership. She's on the National Board of AMDA, the American Medical Director Society, and many, many other things. So with that, Leslie, I will turn it over to you to talk to us today about trust. Thank you so much, Alice, and it is just such an honor to be here. So thank you for having me. So today we're going to talk about building trust in the post-acute and long-term care uh, facilities in the post-COVID era. And I really think this is similar to when you roll the dice and the dice are in the air, and this is the moment when we can affect how they land. And so we'll be talking about what motivates staff to continue to walk through our doors. Next slide, please. So I have no disclosures or conflicts of interest. Next slide. And I really think that when we start trying to assess what motivates our staff to come back each day. And I think that's such a relevant conversation to be having right now as we're all struggling with staff retention. I think the cornerstone of that conversation is about a foundation of trust. So we know that trust is dose dependent. It's certainly not a one and done and it needs maintenance. Trust is built, we can't mandate it or ask for it. And certainly it always has to have that element of authenticity. If you believe that I'm being real with you, that I'm all in, you'll know it. It's palpable, people know it when they see it. But when I walk into my facilities each week, I actually really consider what would make me trustworthy, worthy of your trust. And it has to be more than good intentions. You have to see it in my actions, in my follow through, and the most important thing I think we have to bring with us every day to work and with our interactions with everyone is that trust is personal. It, it really needs you to have a buy-in into this process of building relationships. Next slide, please. So one of the few silver linings of the pandemic, I'm not sure there were a lot, is that ACA and NACAL developed this educational system. I encourage you to go and check it out. Um, about the three drivers of trust. And the entire educational uh, system was built upon a YouTube vi video by Dr. Frances Fry. She is a Harvard business professor. And this 15 minute TED talk is well worth your time. Please go and Google it, check it out. And she talks about the three pillars of, tr of trust that is like three pillars that would make a stool stable. Of course, they are authenticity, empathy, and logic. And how does that play out in our space? So authenticity, we found that that was imperative, especially during the pandemic, and especially when we started talking about this new COVID-19 vaccine. It was this messenger RNA vaccine. If people didn't really think that you were being authentic and truthful, being your real self, really that conversation went nowhere. 
And so we know that authenticity is really imperative to building that foundation of trust. And then you can build from there, of course. You also need to believe that I'm invested in you, that I care what happens to you, and that our relationship is, is meaningful to me as well. And so that empathy is really imperative as well. And finally, I need to say things that actually make sense. That if I'm going to talk to you about a new messenger RNA vaccine or a new fall program or anything like that, I have to have some data to share with you as to why this is important to do and why it is factual. Is it science? Next slide, please. And so I really like this slide because trust is built on relationships, but I also think it's built on opportunity. Every day when we walk into our facilities, we have an opportunity to start that process of investing in people and building relationships. And so, yes, we need relationships to build trust, but we can choose to engage in that any day. And so now I'd like to also sprinkle this presentation with a couple of stories and personal experiences. So I'm going to ask them to pause uh, our slides, and then I'm going to tell you one of the stories. This story actually happened way before the pandemic. It was when I was sitting at the nurse's station, putting in some orders, and a CNA who I'd known for a lot of years came up to me and said, oh, Dr. Eber, can I show you something? Of course. And I had known that she had moved with her family from Mexico, and we had developed this relationship where I told her the places that I had visited in Mexico and where she had come from, and we had this lovely rapport. She came and she brought me to one of my patients who is just a great guy. He had this huge smile, and he loved to walk around the facility with his walker, his favorite thing, all day long, and he would visit with people, and he had this infectious about him with his joy of traveling about the facility. And she showed me his wrist, which was swollen and a little bit red. And when I asked him about it, oh, does your wrist hurt? And he's like, no, I'm fine. But when I palpated it, it was a little tender and I saw him wince. And I thanked her for showing this to me. I don't think I would have ever found it. I did an x-ray and indeed he did have a fracture but I never would have found it really. And the next day I thanked her again. With that rapport came better patient care, more authentic patient care, and really uh, elevated the care that this gentleman I had you know, loved taking care of, I wouldn't have found it. And so that's where trust turns into elevation of care and, and joy of care. So we'll go back to the slides. Okay, and we'll go to the next slide. So building trust within our post-acute long-term care community has some specifics about it. And so it's really based on my expectations of you and your expectations of me. So I'm going to expect and hope that not only you're bringing your expertise to the table, but you're going to put in that emotional work to invest in each of the patients and in each other. Your expectations of me are, I assume that you're going to hope that I am going to be transparent and I'm going to be truthful and I'm going to give you the tools to be successful at your job. When we engage in this relationship, we need to do some active listening. And I really want to know how your job is going. I'm going to ask you questions. And I'm going to use those answers to ask you more questions. So you're going to really feel that value that I am invested and what you have to say, and what you think about your job. And I'm going to invite that collaboration. And then we have a working relationship, and I'm honoring you and the work you do, and I'm hoping to earn your trust as well. Next slide, please. And so that has led me to the idea of the your worth it investment in staff. And I found that this is really a successful avenue to build that trust with staff. I'm going to let you know that you're worth my time and my respect, and that you bring expertise to the table that I'm going to honor. And that trust, I'm going to try to get it to be bi-directional, and I'm going to hear your solutions. One of the things that I try to champion in every building I go into is that the people doing the work are going to be the source of the solutions of how things are working and how they are not working. 
And I'm going to listen also to your lived experiences. Have you been to other places? What do you bring to the table? And how are you feeling about the work you're doing? What could make it easier? I'm going to ask a lot of, in questions, and you're going to see my investment in you. Next slide, please. So actions we can all take in, include the respect and valuing of these individual experiences. And now we know we're learning every day. I think we're wiser a little bit now about promoting the sense of belonging. I want you to walk in the door and not only um, feel that it's welcoming, but feel that you're a part of something, something bigger, that you have a sense of purpose. And I always think when I walk into the doors of my facilities, and I don't know if I'm going to uh, show my age, is like cheers that everybody knows my name. I know the people sitting at the front of the building. I know all of their names. And it's that sense of welcoming and belonging that makes me want to come back. And when we encourage and engage the expression of a variety of cultures and communities, we really expand our horizons and enrich our community. We want the, our, we are all welcome here. And leadership really needs to take an active participation in this process. They can't really stand by the sidelines. And what I see most of all is people are apprehensive sometimes to, to try this open door policy or open this up because they worry that what if someone walks into my door and tells me about an inequity or when they were marginalized, how will I deal with that? What will, will I feel uncomfortable? And you may, and I assume that you, you will feel uncomfortable at some times, and that is fine. What we really want to do is acknowledge that this is what's happening and what are the positive steps that we can take together to address it. And once you share your authenticity and your caring, oh my goodness, I had, did not know that this was happening. Let us work together to see how we can make this better. Then you really authenticate that person's lived experience. And that is the road to increasing trust and increasing inclusiveness. So it's really an opportunity. So don't be afraid uh, to feel uncomfortable. Next slide, please. So during the pandemic, I often talked about the big three. I felt like I needed to be credible, transparent and have predictable follow through. When I go to the nursing stations to share new education or to give a COVID-19 update, I really wanted to make sure that I had my facts and I really wanted to be honest about where we were right now. So sometimes, you know, in the very beginning, we did not have enough gowns, we didn't. And I needed to say that out loud and then tell you what I was gonna do next to help with that. And if you asked a question and I didn't know, I said, I'm not sure and I will get back to you and I need to make sure I followed through. Those things I find have continued on past the pandemic and they're still incredibly important in building trust now. People wanna see that you're honest with the workforce challenges and that you have some predictable follow through. You bring um, all of your credibility to the table. Next slide, please. So I really like the Mayo Clinic has a leadership index. And a lot of these things we have just been talking about. But there are five trust-generating leadership behaviors. And I really consider all of these. We talked about inclusion and transparency, soliciting input and ideas, but also supporting professional development, investing in your staff as humans, and asking them, what are your goals? What are your hopes for your career? I, I wanna know about them. I'd like to help you. Think about it if you said that to some of all of your staff, I would like to help you in your goals. Gosh, I would wanna walk into that building again. And then that expression of appreciation and gratitude. So this is something that I do. I try to do like 12 times a day, if not more. There is nothing like being thanked. And you feel so good on the drive home. You're like, you know what? I did something well. Somebody noticed and they thanked me. And that was empowering. And I remember that during the pandemic, and we can pause our slides here if we like. And I'll just wait. Oh, thank you so much. So during the pandemic, during one of the outbreaks in one of my buildings, 
it's a lonely place during those outbreaks. Everybody has their mask on. Everybody's feeling super isolated. And we had one patient who, again, she's a walker. I just love her. And she has these great outfits on every day that match. And so she is very invested in her walker. And she has one of those bags that holds um, a, her bunch of her things that hang over the walker. And one of her wheels was not working. And so I saw the CNA to try to fix the wheel. And she tried it again. And it worked a little bit better. But she tried to fix it again. And she's like, you know, I'm going to ask maintenance to come up. And I thanked her so much because this was really important to this patient. It was her source of joy, independence, and personhood. And she took the time to notice that that wheel wasn't working. And to that patient, that was everything. And I wanted to make sure that someone had noticed that she took that time. So we'll go back to our slides now. And, okay, we'll go to the next slide. So how to promote trust in post-acute and long-term care. These are some more concrete things that you can do today. Be patient, present in making that connection and be intentional with your communication. One of the ways to do that that I found to be really successful is when I go to nursing stations and have conversations and I invite everybody to any kind of educational communication and conversation. So if family members are there or residents are there, everybody is welcome. And if I always invite people to chime in. So if anybody ever raises their hand or has a question, first of all, I'm so excited that they have a question, but I really am very prescriptive on how I respond. And so often it is, that is a great question. Thank you for bringing that up. Or I had that same question too. And this is what I found. Or that, you know, researchers are looking into that and let me find out what else I can see about that issue and I'll bring that back to you. But it's a great thought. Thank you for bringing that up. And you can see, especially that some CNAs and housekeeping or anyone, they stand a little straighter. They have a little bit of pride that they were valued in that moment. They took a risk and they had some courage and they asked their question out loud in front of everybody. And that leads to addressing inequality and power. And I think it's really important that we tend to that. So if people are brave and they take a risk and they raise their hand or they share an idea with you, the way you respond, that is a moment where you can build that trust. You can also address those barriers. So make it more inviting and maybe go into smaller groups and maybe uh, reach out to individuals like therapy or housekeeping or dietary, making sure that they have an opportunity to be valued and their voices to be heard. And sometimes those acts are the exact acts that build that trust. I like the idea of managing up. Again, I believe that uh, often the solutions are going to be found by the people doing that particular task. And so I want to hear those ideas. I'm going to put that into our solution. And of course, when people see that their ideas are being utilized, that their voices are being valued, then they have a lot of pride and they invest in not only those solutions, but in the community that valued them. So we focus also on the A's and not the F's. I always speak with pride about my colleagues and everybody that I work with. You also have to walk the walk. So things go awry. Things happen that are challenging. And sometimes you're uh, tempted to really be reactive. So put your oxygen mask on first. Take a deep breath. Because that's the moment when you can undo a lot of that trust that you spent all that time building. And so be really conscientious. How do I want to model how I'm going to handle this adversity? How are people going to see me react? Am I going to reach out and say, okay, this is challenging. Let us put our heads together and find a solution together. Or what do you think would work in this situation? Reaching out. And then showing empathy, grace, and gratitude and being very specific with your recognition. And so I'd like to tell you one more story. So we'll put it on pause one more time. Thank you. I always freeze for a second. I thought, oh, that's a funny face that I have. 
And so this is a story more recently. Uh, my mom has been struggling with an illness and I have been going back and forth from Denver to New York to help her. And when I came back, I walked into my facility where I just, I do, I love, love the staff. Their integrity and their dedication is profound. And I was chuckling with them how my mom needed a fentanyl patch and I was trying to open it and I didn't really understand the packaging on the fentanyl patch and getting to the patch is actually really quite a challenge. You have two plastic pieces on either side. You have to remove those. And then there's one plastic piece that has, that's divided in half. You kind of fold it in half, get the patch out, and then you can stick it on the patient's arm. And this was a challenge and baffling to me. And I was saying how I, I needed uh, the director of nursing and the nurses and assistant director of nurses to help me out because I did not have this expertise. Their response to me was, oh, we wish your mom lived closer so we could care for her and help you. And at that moment, I just felt I am so lucky to work with these incredibly kind people who would even say that to me, who would care enough about me and that we would have enough respect for one another, that they would put their quarter in and um, say something so gracious and kind to me. And I thought that's where our trust begins. And that's why our respect grows and we work so well together. And so I was uh, continue to be so grateful for working for that, that group, and that staff. And we'll put it back to the slides now. I think it's my last slide. It's like an automatic review. Thank you. So, Five take-home messages, things you can do. Invest time in staff relationships. Sometimes we feel like, gosh, I don't have time to invest the time. But we now know that building that foundation, that investing in the, that time will make everything easier. One of the things that we've seen actually that has been studied is that when you invest that emotional time in staff, in residents, lots of good things happen. Not only do we see people with more satisfaction coming to work, being part of that community, but we see that residents who trust their nurses and CNAs and dietitians that they're more likely to ask for help for private things like going to the bathroom because they trust the people. And they also are much more likely to share when they notice differences. Of course, the person knows this, the difference first. I'm having a little bit more trouble breathing. I notice that my sneakers are a little bit tighter and that's an opportunity to engage and see how we can make things better. Maybe that's the beginning of a congestive heart failure exacerbation. And so building that trust in those relationships, investing in that time, really can lead to better outcomes, better satisfaction, less depression, and less staff turnover. Asking for staff input in developing plans and solutions, invite them to copy and to any meeting that you have and listen, sit back and listen to their perspective. Showing gratitude is easy. Thank everyone for going the extra mile. People are more burnt out these days, even more than 2021 and 2022. We want to show our gratefulness. This is important work, and we want to honor the people who are doing it. Ask what they need to do their job better. Celebrate those successes and always ask for feedback. I am in the habit for always asking, hey, how could I have done that better? Please don't be apprehensive for sharing with me how I can better engage, how I could have the conversation better. One of the uh, ADUNs that I work with a lot, she has a wonderful way of communicating with patients. I learn from her every time we go see a patient together. And so these are things you can do tomorrow. And now I'd like to open it up for your experiences, what has worked for you, and to thank you for joining today. Thanks. Uh, I think that Alice, I think hey, you did it. Thank you, Samaria. <laughs> uh, so I, I believe, so first of all, thank you for an absolutely amazing talk, Leslie. Every time I listen to you, I learn like 10 new things. 
And so I did again. And the chat, I know you can't see the chat while you're showing slides, but the, the chat is just really, really positive about all your wonderful messages. Um, there's a couple of specific uh, thoughts that were, were brought forward here um, that I think might be good to talk about. And, and other people can unmute and, and join in here too. Um, one of them was, could you say a little bit about the, the trust relationship building between residents or care partners and residents and the staff and the administration. And um, if you say a few words, then maybe other people will wanna chime in as well. Sure, I think that that has been a real struggle. We have so many things to do during the day. Nurses have to pass all the medications and CNAs are helping people get up, going to the bathroom, getting to the dining room. And I think it needs to be very intentional that both staff have to be gifted some time to do that emotional work to have a conversation and to spend some time with those residents. And that leadership can play a key role in fostering that trust. But it has to be really a discussion, a partnership, and very intentionality that we make that space available so that people can check in with one another. And not only with um, staff and residents and staff and family, it, it's really a give and take. But we all have to come to the table with an immense amount of respect. So I respect my residents and their point of view and their caregivers and their family members. And I'm hoping to partner with them. And I think it works best when caregivers and residents are willing to partner with staff and with uh, nurses and CNAs and dietitians and respect that side as well. I think when you have that mutual respect, you open that door for possibilities for building that trust. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, one of our wonderful steering committee members, um, Dr. Barbara Bowers, is on this call and she's chatting in. Barb, I don't know if you want to unmute and talk a little bit about what you said but in your comment there or anything else related to this trust issue, because Barbara works with many, many residents who joined the coalition uh, and outside of her coalition work, too. So, Barb, what well would you I was just saying it just was yesterday when we were having I was having a conversation with I think it was seven residents about trust and one of them said well I have a great example. If someone comes in and says so what do you want um, or what do you need now or what do you want now which often happens as opposed to how can I help you it just makes a world of difference. Yeah I, I agree I always try to before I leave the patient what can I get for you. Mm -hmm. How can, what else can uh, we do to make things easier so that before you leave the room, you make that offering to let them know that you're ready to listen. Right. Yeah. And, and also that you, that you're focused on them. I mean, right. that's so we forget that, you know, and unless you, you have been a patient or have been a resident or have been a family member, and many of you have been in one or more of those roles, but not everyone has, but it makes such a difference when you're on, you know, in that role. And it, when someone says, you know, what can I do for you right now? What would, what would make things better for you? Or, you know, just that, that specificity and that focus. Um, and Karen Klink, you have your hand up. Uh, <laughs> let us know your thoughts. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm the one that brought up about the trust and, you know, I mean, I love what, what, what Dr. Eber said about all the trust and, but all those principles, um, need to be taught, you know, to, to, to staff administration in long-term care in, you know, in, you know, in their interactions with family and residents. And, and I don't see that, that, that happening as somebody pointed out, it is an us versus them situation for, for many, for many, many of us. And, and the trust is, is not there. And, and, and it's, and it's hard enough between admin and staff, but it's less so with residents and, you know, and the people that run the long-term care. And, you know, and I've been told if you don't trust, if you don't trust us, why do you have your mother here? You should move her out. Like, it's like, I've been told that more times than I can count, but I, you know, I've had not, I've, I've been, my mom has been in more than one place and the trust is not there and trust has to be built, as you said. And um, I don't automatically trust. I automatically distrust, unfortunately. So um, all of these things, yes. I mean, that you know that stuff. It, it doesn't come automatically, and it, it's very, very difficult. 
And if we've been betrayed over and over again, and we've been, you know, we are not trusting, um, I, I think this is all this stuff is, you know, important for, for, for staff, you know, yeah. feel these things, but it's also very important for residents and families to be able to have, have these things also. Thank you. Right. Thank, thank you, Karen. And you've been one of the steady, strong voices uh, throughout our coalition, and we appreciate it. Leslie, do you want to respond or, you know, again, frame what, what Karen was saying in terms of those early steps? Like, what are the, you know, two or three things or even the one thing that people could do? Sure. I mean, Karen, I think that what you bring up is really imperative. I think we are a work in progress. And so I think that some of it is being is rebuilding. I think you're right that uh, this is not always taught. And so we're in the process of taking those steps. And it, it takes a little bit of, of courage and um, putting your hand forward too to say, I would like this, how can we work on this better? And so that we can foster opportunity between you and staff or leadership or administration. And how can we take those baby steps? But you're right. Um, we are all a works in progress. So I think that there is opportunity there. And I, when I see it work best is when both sides are willing. Both sides are willing to uh, put their hand forward saying, I want this to work. When you have buy-in on, on all sides, then the likelihood of success really goes up exponentially. And I'll, I just want to add to that, um, again, in the Moving Forward Coalition, as many of you know, um, we have uh, tried to think about how to integrate principles like building trust into multiple action plans. So you know, again, there are action plans. We've got uh, Mary Luciafi on this call. She's involved with one of the ones on goals and priorities. Um, we have other committee members. You, you heard from Barb Bowers about, you know, resident preferences, and we've got people working on resident councils and other aspects of practice. But I also want to highlight, we have a number of people on this call from QIN, QIO programs around the country. Um, quite a, a few of them, Lisa Bridwell's on, Linda Kluge's on, Kim McCray on and others, and some of you are from long-term care ombudsman programs and, and other, you know, entities that really focus on, so how can we make change happen? Not how can we talk about it, but how can we make it happen and really implement not just educational programs, but that ongoing support that Leslie was talking about, that when she walks into a residence room or she walks into a, a staff meeting, that there's that rapport. And how do you get there? Because you don't automatically have that when you walk in the building. So um, anybody on this call, anybody at all, we've got advocates on this call, multiple advocacy organizations, Anybody should really please speak up and, and help us understand your thoughts. So Dr. Dan Hamowitz, you have your hand up, sir. I do. Hey, Leslie, that was great. I, I learned so many things. If I was like a quarter as good a doctor as you were, that would be terrific. <laughs> but, but I just wanted to emphasize the, the communication part of this in, in two different ways. One is, is that for some reason in long-term care, people are so defensive. I've seen administrators who I, who I really, really like when a, a family member or a resident comes up to them, they're like automatically defensive. So that's something I, I find the ombudsman are really typically very, very good at communicating. The other thing that I've, I've never read, and this is just from my experience, but I think it's such a good thing is whatever, whatever per, however a person presents themselves, right? Uh, particularly a family, however they present themselves, it's their ways of showing they care. So like if they're nice, you think, oh, they care. But if they're yelling at you, instead of like, because everybody, many people are like, oh, you know, you know, it's not my fault. I didn't do it. Somebody else, blah, blah, blah. If you think they're yelling because they care, they're angry because they care. They don't talk because they care. You, you, you typically shouldn't assume, but I think assuming people care and going from there has helped me so much. And I think it's a really good principle. So, but Leslie, you're the smart one here. So <laughs> you know, what do you think? Every, everybody uh, I, on this call is the smart one. Like, <laughs> I agree completely, Leslie, Dan. Thank you for coming. Her props, Al. Um, I also think sometimes asking a question. So if someone is very frustrated, find out more. Uh, so when did you see this happen? And let's kind of talk about how we can prevent this happening again, or what would work better? What would work better? 
And yeah. so then people start to feel that they're heard, that their concerns are, are valuable. Mm -hmm. And then I think that that is a pathway, not only towards building trust, but some solutions as well. You know, I, can, I agree, Leslie, like if somebody comes up and they're angry because mom's diaper is wet, I think the good way to handle it is say, okay, show me, let's work on this together. Mm -hmm. um, I'll see, let me find you the right person. I, I think taking some responsibility for it together really helps. Yeah, I think Thanks. that's great. And um, before we turn to Patty Moore, who's had her hand up for a couple of minutes, I just wanted to say also in the chat, Irma Rappaport put in um, some information about the Essential Caregivers Act. And, um, you know, again, there's there's a lot of activity around the country on caregiving issues, legislative aspects, regulatory, and just being an advocate and promoting the policies. So I would just draw your attention to that. Paul Falkowski talked about volunteerism and some of the programs he's been involved in. Thank you for putting in your website there, Paul. And um, Patty Moore, tell us from Martha's Vineyard or wherever you are, what, uh, what <laughs> you'd like to share. <laughs> yes, Martha's Vineyard. Um, we too have all of these same issues and challenges for sure. Um, I think it's important to, when moving toward this wonderful world that you are helping us form, Leslie, um, to think, to do it carefully. And I mean, exactly carefully and to look for allies within the organization first before you just jump in because you can get chewed up and spit out very quickly. Uh, and your ability to be a trustworthy ally um, can get severely dented. So I would hope that moving forward could help lead the way in some of those uh, conversations within an organization so that it is, it is phased in some way, because otherwise the damage can be very high and we don't have that many chances. So thank you all for everything that you're doing. Well, thank you. And for, for people who do not know Patty, I've had the privilege of knowing and working with her for several years in the work she's doing um, to bring age-friendly care and support to people uh, who are older who live on Martha's Vineyard um, and uh, everything from housing to health care and lots of other things. So she she is one of the true champions on this call. Um, so thank you, Patty, for that. And, you know, it's a great point about working with other organizations from the very beginning moving forward has tried really hard to say over and over, we are not the group that has all the answers. We, we never will be. What we do is convene organizations that do this work and build on their, build on their shoulders and their work. Again, there, there are people on this call who've been doing work for 30 or 40 years in this space. So we really want to learn from them and work with them. So um, Carolyn Kasdan from iPro. Oh, um, can I just uh, chime in oh, and sure. just yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Patty, I just want to honor your comments. Uh, I think you're right that these things can be difficult. They can backfire and you cannot find a friend on the other side of that conversation. And I think that that is absolutely uh, something we need to tend to and be very prescriptive about that um, from corporate leadership down into each one of our communities to really be very intentional that that is not the way we want to move forward that we really want to respect that if someone is reaching out, if they are asking a question, if they want to invest in our community, that we need to be ready to listen and not make it a punitive situation. And so I think that your ideas and this idea is really important to speak about. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Carolyn, over to you. Hi, I had a couple of thoughts and one of them really was uh, along the lines of what Dan was saying about assumptions. I had such an aha moment as an administrator one day when I had a staff member come into my office in a panic because the family was sitting there writing notes in the room. And, and her thought was, oh, they're, they're trying to catch me at something, right? When we're really out there preaching, patients should have involved care partners and take notes and make lists of your questions. And so I think you really do have to be very intentional about creating that environment where people understand it's, it's okay to take notes and ask questions and be involved and not make those assumptions and label people as a problem family or as you know, a, a staff member. So that was a real moment for me and really impacted how I addressed um, 
trying to set that stage in my buildings after that. And the other thing I think it's, uh, is that we have a land, you know, a gold mine of information in our patient and family um, councils or our resident and family councils about the state of trust and uh, in our buildings. And that's a great group to really work with to talk about, you know, where the levels of trust are and aren't now and how we can positively collaborate moving forward. And it's a great way to make those, help with those meetings really be robust and productive and not just you know, let's talk about the menu for next week or a, a, a common complaint. Yeah, and and thank you. So IPRO is one of the QIN QIOs um, that's on this call today. And um, again, I just, I wanna point out the rather remarkable array of organizations on this call, um, which is what we strive for. So I, I'm glad to see it, but you know, we have geriatricians, we have nurses, we have funders. So many thanks to uh, Nancy Wexler's on the phone from the John A. Hartford Foundation that funds this work. Um, we have advocacy organizations. We have um, people from professional associations, QIOs, ombudsmen. Uh, we have nurse, We have nursing home residents, uh, Jeanette uh, uh, Sullivan Martinez from our steering committees on this call and others. We have family members. Um, so uh, this is a pretty remarkable group. And we, we have accrediting organizations. We have the Joint Commission. Um, so, uh, you know, we really appreciate that people get on these calls and really want to hear from one another and, and make the linkages and align the work that we're all doing. Sometimes people say, well, why do we need another group? But I, I think today's call is a good example of, you know, when we get a thousand people signed up on our website, which we have um, from all over the country, we can really do some meaningful work. We've, you know, we've got a critical mass. So um, just wanted to point that out. Anyway, Jessica Coleman, over to you uh, for your comments. Hi, good afternoon. Dr. Eber, thank you so much. And uh, as a geriatrician and medical director, I, I just wanted to add that the importance of customer service and anticipatory guidance goes just a huge way in developing trust. It's that simple thing I learned in Girl Scouts many years ago, you do what you say and you say what you do, and that forms the foundation for building trust with families. I think when we look at it from more of a customer service aspect, we get a little cringy because we start to think, well, wait a minute. But we're about taking care of people and we're all very kind hearted and we want to do the best for people on an individual level, which is why we're all on the call this afternoon. But I think we need to focus on that part of the standardization that comes along with customer service where when you check into an Airbnb or a hotel and they tell you, they tell you you're gonna have this many towels and this much coffee and someone is gonna call you and this is the code to get in, we're not getting that at the nursing homes anymore. There's no, you're coming in with such a distrust because you're having the information, you're not getting that anticipatory guidance. So I just wanna make the point that, that we need to focus on the standardization of those aspects as much as we focus on the standardization of treatment of diabetes and heart failure and end of life processes. And, and again, just thank you so much to everybody who's on this call. I, I, I've already learned a million things. <laughs> and, and Jessica, you are a medical director in the state of Ohio, active with the AMDA chapter there, is that correct? Yes, ma'am, that's right. Okay, I just wanted to make sure I had the right Jessica Coleman. Um, so just for others on the call, Dr. Coleman is um, doing incredible statewide policy work with her colleague, Dr. Tom Lenner and others um, working with um, the Division on Aging Director, Ursula McElroy in Ohio. Um, they've got you know a statewide plan for aging and they've got a task force that is directed by the governor um, to do some very specific work and Dr. Coleman and Dr. Lehner and others um, through a the AMDA chapter there are really uh, leading on a lot of this and fortunately we've been fortunate to have been invited to also uh, work with uh, Director McElroy and we are doing that we have a call in a couple of weeks so just bringing it as an example of, you know, a clinician, a medical director, someone who's with residents and families every day, um, who also is involved in statewide work for meaningful change. So um, I would just, you know, go back and also uh, introduce Jane Carmody, who I didn't see her photo, so I kept forgetting she's on the call. She's just listening because she's on her phone. But she wanted uh, us to see that the nursing home ANCC Pathway to Excellence um, is also a very good program. And uh, 
um, moving forward has done work with that program also, and it's a, it's a great resource. So um, you can take a look at that. There's a curriculum online. Um, so um, anyway, uh, I just wanna make sure everybody who wants to make a comment has a chance to speak up. As I look through, I see Christina Ramsey. She's also one of our um, committee members. It's done a lot of work on workforce. Um, we have Alice, other... while, you're, while you're looking, could I also add that for our family members uh, that are on the call, all of the QIOs have uh, patient and family councils as well working on quality improvement efforts. So, you know, there's a great opportunity to engage with the QIOs and really um, inform that work in a broader level than just, you know, impacting one facility. So I, I encourage all the consumers on the call that have experience as a patient or a care partner to to consider reaching out to their QIO and getting involved that way as well. And I also- Oh, go ahead. <laughs> oh, I just wanted to also bring back to the forefront of that nurse who saw the people writing, uh, the family members writing, got very nervous. And I think we also have to know that there's been a lot of kind of personal trauma in working in this space through the pandemic and that, um, realizing that and giving some grace that people may be nervous, they may be scared, they want to do the right thing. And that most often people who are working in this space, we are working here because it gives us a sense of purpose. We want to do something good. And we want to bring uh, help and some maybe joy to the people around us. And coming into conversations with that perspective, I think can be helpful in starting to build that foundation of trust. And so, and knowing that people may be nervous, they may be scared. Um, I think we have to realize that more maybe than we do. Um, yeah, being scared is a big issue. And there's, a, and, and it goes across everybody. It goes across all of us, you Absolutely. know, whether we're providers, a family member, a, a, a resident or patient. Absolutely. Um, a couple more things from the chat, just to highlight them for folks. So I don't know, Melody uh, Stark, if you, if you want to um, say anything more about what you put in, but uh, Melody chatted in about medical directors and um, a piece of legislation about um, med medical directors and SNFs and having that reported, that's been an issue and, and others have worked on for a long time. So Melody, is there anything else you might want to add to that or just direct people to checking it out? Hi, thanks, Alice. Um, sorry, I'm doing a lot of multitasking here, working and sort of listening in. Uh, but yes, I, I think this is one of the bills that people aren't aware of. And maybe um, Dr. Dan, you might be able to speak to it um, in, in a broader uh, in more detail. No, Lee, I'd, I'd be delighted way. to. I didn't, I, I, set her, I didn't set her up to do this, by the way. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I just got the Venmo on my uh, phone oh, here. No. You're, under, you're underpaid, Melody. So, so just, you know, House Bill, House Bill, uh, so HR 177 is really short. Basically, all it says is it wants the requirement for um, the name of the medical director to be listed publicly. It's the easiest thing. It's all, you know, it's 200 words. Um, so it, it's extremely low cost. It's extremely low effort. And there's whole kinds of benefits from having a list of the medical directors because then it can, it's a bi-directional way of education. You know, what's happening on the ground? What's the, you know, educational opportunities or information that's coming from, you know, all kinds of people, ways for different organizations to get medical directors to either talk at or be a part of their meetings. I mean, I, I don't see much of a downside to it. So the, the ask really is to go in every state, go to your congressman and just say, hey, look, here's a real simple thing. Um, you know, um, yeah, yeah, I can get you the copy. It's really easy. Just say, look, all we want you to do is sign on to it. So Melody, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for bringing up. And everybody, we, we really uh, appreciate your consideration for that because it's just the simplest thing. Yeah, and, but, and the simplest, oh, go ahead. <laughs> I, I completely agree. Thank you, Dan. Um, 
it really then also ups that level of trust and accountability and mutual respect. When you have somebody that you can call and ask a question and, and find some direction, that is powerful. It also really takes the level of care in all nursing homes up a level as well. Because when we can reach out to all the medical directors and say, hey, this is the latest for COVID-19, this is what you need to know and share with all the providers and all the staff, and all the residents and family members. It really gives us the ability to share and, and communicate information that's necessary with everyone. So it's very empowering. And I'll, I'll pile on. It's, it's definitely transparency. Many people don't know who their medical director is. Many people don't know the facility even has a medical director, but from a quality point of view too, there are medical directors who might be underqualified. Like we hear these horror stories about nursing and medical directors who are like, you know, pediatric oncologists or, you know, th things like that, or a medical director who's, who's a medical director at 30 different nursing homes, which Leslie, I think you would agree, it's impossible to give good care uh, if you're medical director at 30 different places. So Absolutely. there's multiple good reasons for supporting this bill, we think. Yes. Um, I just wanted to uh, take a moment to see Jeanette or I know Cindy Napolitan is, uh, they're both committee members with us. Is there anything either of you would want to add to this conversation as, as nursing home residents? Sure, I'd like to say something, Alice. Um, the thing that crossed my mind is uh, best practices for most staff members when they come in is they're always said, well, make sure you treat the residents like your mother or your sister or your grandmother. But in hindsight, not everybody had a great relationship with those people in their lives. Mm -hmm. So basically, if we can go back to basics and you know, kind of the golden rule, treat people the way you want to be treated. If you can give of yourself in a personal, professional way to your residents, then they in turn will open up and be, feel trust, feel your trust. They will trust you. You then open a good rapport and that can go along with all the staff members. Um, something that kept resonating me to me as everyone was sharing is kindness is free. So being kind to someone, no matter what apartment they're in, what whether it's another resident to resident, whether it's a resident to a CNA or nurse or an administrator to a nurse, kindness is free. And if we take a step back and think about how do we want to be treated in this situation and then extend it to the others, I think we will make really good progress. So that's my thoughts for today. Love it. Thank you so much. Cindy, do you have anything you'd like to share? I wanted to talk a little bit about trust building. Um, I have talked to many family members who have had issues and they've talked personally to say the DON or the ADON. I've always advised them to follow up with an email to that person, thanking them for their time explaining what the issue was and then coming up with a timeline to get back. Um, you always have a record that way of who you spoke to and that seems to help a lot in trust building because if they don't respond, then you can always send it up the ladder of people that you can let them know that they're not responding to you. So that seems to help a lot. Thank you so much. There's, there's, you know, no way we could have these calls mean so much to us without you guys. So thank you. Thank you, everyone on this call who's put in great information. Um, before we wrap up, I know we have about three minutes left. I just, uh, Jane Carmody, I don't know if you're able to unmute yourself and say anything on behalf of John A. Hartford Foundation. Otherwise, we'll ask Nancy to do so. But Jane, do you have anything you'd like to say to the group? She might be driving or something. Nancy, I think this we'll- This is Nancy. I'll just, I think Jane's on a train and I know she's actively involved. She just couldn't, can't get off mute so easily. Um, I'll just, I think Jane already put it in the chat, but for those who could, didn't see, um, the John A. Hartford Foundation is grateful to everybody on this call. We learn so much, we gain so much. We know that this is essential work and everybody's input here means so much. And this was, this was incredible, this discussion today. So thank you, Dr. Eber. Thank you, everybody. Wonderful, thank you. So Leslie, we'll, we'll give you the last word here. If you uh, have anything else you'd like to add or respond to, we're so grateful that you were on the call and gave this great presentation today. 
Well, thank you. It is an honor to do the work that uh, we all do. It is an honor. And so that's my thought when I walk in every morning is what an honor it is to be here and to be able to partner with these residents and the staff and my colleagues. Uh, how lucky am I? So thank you. All right, and I just um, chatted in the uh, last thing and uh, many thanks to Sumeri Maki, who's uh, run the call today and to Isaac Langobardi, our director as well. But um, please check back. The action plans will be posted on our website by mid-July. We would love to know what you think. And we're gonna have a lot of these coalition conversations that are gonna focus on those action plans after we've posted them. So uh, again, a heartfelt thank you to everybody on this call. Please you know, join us again. Uh, we so value all of your input and hope everybody has a great rest of your day and rest of your week. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.